you again for joining our fourth and final chapter in the Defence Gender Network International Men's Day 2022 event, the Leading by Example and Wellbeing Conference. This piece is broken up into a number of sections, beginning with the Challenge of Men's Health by Dr. David Evans. Yeah, for joining us today, David. Uh, You're welcome. To introduce David, uh, he's currently the Professor in Sexualities, Agendas, Health and Wellbeing at the University of Greenwich. Um, I'm also told that you're a Welsh rugby player who used to be a Catholic priest uh, and was at the forefront of HIV nursing in London in the 1980s. Um, the more I read about David, uh, the more I see that he's um, been a leading light in his field. Um, he's got numerous awards um, which he may, he, may, he may cover in terms of sort of w where he's been and what he's done. But thanks very much for joining us today, David. We're extremely grateful and over to you. Thanks so much. The only one thing you got wrong there is I've never been a Welsh rugby player. Chance would have been a fine thing. Uh, but yeah, I do follow Wales rugby uh, quite passionately. Uh, Richie, thanks so much for inviting me to be here today and to all of you. And I've got to start with an apology that I've used this dreadful pun in the title for the session, When Your Helmet Won't Protect You. But I actually used it as a... Um, as a title in a session I did on sexual infections to the Defence Medical Welfare Service a few years ago. So I thought I would just resurrect the title and use it again. Uh, but certainly this whole presentation then is tapping into uh, the, 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 the message for your conference, the challenges for men's health. And I'd say we really need to be honest with those challenges uh, before we can move on to, uh, to do whatever it is we're going to do to improve on that health. And I'm really appreciative to the three earlier speakers. It's been an inspirational day. Um, I, I've been here for the whole lot. So thank you so much to the earlier presenters. Um, what I want to do here is start off by looking at the, the theme for your conference and then the three key aims for International Men's Day. And even this first one, starting off by leading by example, and we've seen three great examples all day, so it is possible to lead by example. But sometimes that can also be a bit of a pressure on individuals as well. Because if we're expected to lead by example, sometimes we don't do as well as maybe we'd want to. So even just by looking at me, you can probably tell that I don't exercise enough, I don't moisturise enough, and um, I'm far too keen on sugar. OK, so from that point of view, I'm not leading well at all. But what I hope to do is to show that the important element is that we strive, constantly striving to improve no matter where we are, whatever stage we're at in life. It's that striving that's important. So in that case, maybe a lot more carrot and less stick, because certainly when we look at lots of health promotion messages, whether it's about smoking, alcohol consumption, whatever the messages are, quite often they contain a lot of stick and not enough carrot. So I suggest that's what we need to do, especially to be able to strive to do better and to pat ourselves on the back, to celebrate when things are going well. And if we do that, then we're certainly going to be able to tap in to these three key aims of International uh, uh, Men's Day. So making a positive difference, looking at how to promote those positive conversations, because sometimes, as our earlier speakers have said, sometimes it's really difficult just to get the conversation off the ground, to be able to break through, to start talking to people, especially if it seemed to be about sensitive issues or issues that are covered in taboo or stigma, things that people find difficult to talk about. So really important that we look at promoting those positive conversations and then galvanising the help of others to look at ways in which we can get um, um, greater awareness for support from others. But let me just say a little bit about um, some of my experiences with earlier uh, military conferences. I've been really lucky to speak at quite a few um, conferences and to run some training events. Uh, at one time I spoke at the um, what was the RAF Hospital Wegberg in northern Germany. 
um, the Matrons in Chief conference that was at RAF Coningsby. Um, and from that, quite a number of army nurses, still to this very day, come and do sexual health modules with us at Greenwich. Some of them have done the top-up degree in sexual health, and some of them are now currently studying for master's degree as well. So there's been this great relationship between um, particularly the army and the University of Greenwich. And what I've noticed over this time, over these past couple of decades, is look at all the positive changes. So again, a real wonderful opportunity pat yourselves on the back for doing so much that, um, and I've just got a few things listed here but so many ways in which army life has changed but before I move on let me just tell you about the very first conference I spoke at and um, when Richard McCann showed a photograph this morning of the military barracks down at Woolwich the local hospital there is Queen Elizabeth, and that's my local hospital just down the hill. And Queen Elizabeth used to be an army hospital. And I went to speak to soldiers and sailors at this big conference that was on for about a week. And I had to talk about sexuality issues, and this was in the early 90s, when there was that dreadful ban, for those of you that know the word, that ban against lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people being out and serving in the armed forces. So I had to talk to them about it. So it's a really difficult conversation to have knowing what the legal implications were around the whole topic we were discussing. So they were in a big lecture hall, sitting from top to, uh, you know, from the bottom right up to the back. They were in this lecture hall, and I could sense that some of them were feeling rather nervous about being at this whole day. They didn't know what they were going to be expected to do or what they were going to be expected to say. So there wasn't much eye contact going on, and there were lots of folded arms and heads down and just not looking at me. And I tend to walk around, I can't at home here, but I tend to walk around quite a lot when I'm on a, on a, on a stage, and I don't go over to the podium where, where the microphone is. But I was asking them about sexuality issues and they were being so reluctant, they just didn't want to talk at all. And I mentioned lesbian women and asked them what they knew about lesbian women. And some of the descriptors coming out were, you know, they wear sensible shoes, short hair, senior officers. And I'm thinking, blimey, this is most of the women in this, in this particular group. But when I asked them then about gay males, there was a real stony silence, especially from all the men in the audience. And uh, one of them actually turned around and said, nobody like, in our, nobody like that in our regiment, mate. You know, they really didn't want to engage on this. And internally, I was thinking, this is a really tough audience to try to get through to. And I thought, I need to do something just to break the ice here. So I asked them about bisexual people. And the silence was even bigger at this point. So I said, look, it seems to me that you think you know what lesbian women are like. You may know what gay men are like, but they're not in your regiment, but you haven't got a clue when it comes to bisexual people. And at this point, I walked over to the podium and I went up right close to the microphone and I said, well, listen, I'll let you into a little secret. And then the eyes were on me. I said, I'll let you into a little secret. I'm bisexual. I like soldiers and sailors. And with that, they all burst out laughing and that seemed to break the ice for the day. And certainly from that point, they were being more open and more engaging. Now, just think of what I've said about breaking the ice, even using humour. So lots of the stuff that men may have to talk about, they may find it difficult because they may consider it embarrassing. But look how so often we may laugh when we're embarrassed. Maybe we don't mean to, maybe it's just a sort of anxious laugh, but we tend to laugh a bit. So trying to get our message across using appropriate humour can be really excellent, especially if people are going to find things rather difficult. So I say from some of my experiences with military conferences, um, that's the one big takeaway message that I go away with is using humour. So what I want to do for the rest of the presentation here is focus on these three key areas of International Men's Day. And 
If we're looking at advocating for each other, whether across genders, whether within our own gender, looking at advocating for others, we need to be advocating in such a way to make a positive difference. OK, so even from this uh, conference today, when Richie was saying at the beginning, take away one key message from each speaker for, um, uh, with you. If you all go away and take away one message and act on it positively, that's the difference that you can be making to the well-being of, of the lives of men and boys. But when I said at the beginning we need to take some of the baggage on board first, that's where this word intersectionality is coming in. Because as a male gender, um, there's a lot of baggage we carry with us. Now, I'm not going to go through everything on the screen, and as soon as I finish talking, I'll post this Prezi to you. But maybe one thing you could take away from this is take away this Prezi. And if you are going to be working with groups to talk about these issues, pick in to some of the, the issues I've listed here. And lots of these I've got from the various articles I've read now recently, ready uh, uh, for this uh, presentation. But if I just take one or two from here, the first one I want to talk about is the, the age ranges. Look how in His Majesty's Armed Services you've got people across all age ranges, either those serving or maybe even the families and veterans. So you're a much bigger community than just those that wear the uniform. And in that case, it will be looking at people from very young age right through to old age. Even when we're looking at this from the point of view of health, look how health impacts differently at various stages of a, a boy or a man's life. So if we're looking at younger ages, look at um, taking risks. Now, I've actually written risk taking a bit further down and I've said no risk, no fun. If you lot didn't take risks, me and my lot, the civilians, we wouldn't be as protected as we are. So you're accustomed to taking risks. It's in your very DNA that you take risks. And yet, when it comes to safer sex messages, for example, people say, oh, don't take risks or don't do that, something will go wrong. So quite often there's that stick, the wagging finger, telling people what not to do. And yet, on the other hand, we're encouraging risk taking. But look at some of the negative implications of risk. Look how, um, well, the suicide rate in under 50 year olds, the uh, road traffic accident deaths in the under 24 year olds, the higher levels of sexual infections in the younger ones, testicular cancer, younger age. So being a male, Lots of the things that's on this screen for you now can intersect across the person's life course, but especially then starting at young age, and look how it can then be built on as a person grows older. So even with um, the culture of alcohol use in, in Britain and in the armed forces, look at how so many young people may be into binge drinking. But give them a couple of decades of binge drinking and look at the further implications on life. Obesity, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease, erectile dysfunction. So all of these things, most of which are so preventable, actually started earlier in life. So really, really important to consider the impact right across age. And even when I said then about sexual infections, predominantly in, uh, say, under 24-year-olds, but there is a rising increase in um, over 50 year old people now. And that may be because um, some older people might say, well, look, I did have a primary relationship and for one reason or other, that relationship's over now. So maybe I've got a bit of freedom at the moment or I'm looking for new relationships. And especially, um, uh, especially from the point of view of women, when women may think, oh, well, I I had my kids in the 20s, I've passed that now, not realising they're still fertile. You know, unless they've gone through the menopause, they're still going to be fertile. So unplanned conceptions can happen later in life, as well as um, sexual infections. So the rate is rising in the older groups as well. But also sometimes it's going to be a case of considering um, uh, different aspects of the person's life. And when you look down this list, there's just so much on there. I just want to pick up with two more before I move on with this one, please. The first one right towards the bottom when it says the help seeking abilities. 
Now, even if you look at general practice settings in civilian life, look how more often than not, the greatest number of people that access GP services are females, girls and women. They access GP services. And even when it comes to some of the preventable conditions or illnesses in men, look how many of them are because they buried their head in the sand. They didn't talk about it, they didn't mention it, they didn't go and seek help beforehand. So one of the really important takeaway messages from this is we need to look at ways of boosting this help-seeking ability. How can we encourage more males, right across the life course, more males to engage with help help seeking um, their help seeking abilities and one of the ways is looking at all of these issues on here and helping a male to be more comfortable in his own skin okay look how many people don't feel too good about themselves or maybe there are aspects of themselves they're not too keen on so it's looking at ways of addressing the comfort in our own skin and let me just slide back here because there's a wonderful little quote from um, a royal uh, Royal Air Force officer, uh, Flight Lieutenant Adam, when he says there are a million ways your life can conspire against you. And I'd say if you look at that list here, these are lots of those ways. Now, especially if you're going to take this message away with you and maybe on a training event, explore each of them in greater depth and then look at even more intersection, the way in which lots of these issues then confront the male as well. So there's being a male to start off with, but then how many males are going through so many of the different aspects on the screen in front of you now? Okay, so very important to consider those, and that's what that word intersectionality means. It's the crossover, the interrelation between all these differences, differences for each one of us as human people, and then um, the ways in which health can impact on us negatively. So the second aspect of the International Men's Day is focusing on education. And here I'd say education about promoting positive conversations about men, about manhood and about masculinity. Maybe we ought to say masculinity in, a, in the plural sense, masculinities. There's not just one way to be a man. And the singer Gloria Gaynor came out with a most wonderful line where she says, it's one life, no return, no deposit. Your life is a sham until you can shout out, I am what I am. Now, I know Richard McCann threatened that we were going to sing this morning, but I'm not going to sing that line at you. But that's important because when you consider, especially from a mental health point of view, a mental health point of view, look how many people are encouraging us to become fully human, fully alive, fully individuated. All the different psychological theories that talk about us becoming the most full and complete person we can be. And yet when you read lots of those theories or, or hear people talking about them, quite often it's about do your very best physically and do your very best mentally. It's looking at those two dimensions. But personally, and obviously because of my role in sexualities and genders, I would say we can't just talk about those two. If we say we're looking after the people that we work with holistically, and yet we don't address the sexual well-being part of their lives, then forget it. We're not caring for them holistically. We're not working with them holistically because the sexual health dimensions are as equally as important as the physical or the mental. So really important. But from your own point of view, for all of you here at the conference today, you may think, well, that's OK for him to talk about it, but I'm not sure what I should be talking about or actually how to go about talking about it. So that's why it's really important that you you look to educating yourselves as well in as much as you need around all these various sexual dimensions of life. OK, so that you do feel enabled and to an extent that you feel happy with and know where and when you can refer on if you feel then out of your comfort zone. So when you think, well, look, somebody's talking about specialist issues here, 
and I'm not the specialist, know how and when to refer that person on. Okay, so from that point of view, I'd say we've got three things to consider. The first one is just to be able to talk about sex. And I keep putting a little asterisk on this because by sex, I mean sex, sexualities, sexual health, well-being, anything in the list down the side. Okay, it's looking at ways in which we can actually talk about all of uh, those issues. But what's going to be really, really important for us then is asking um, these critical questions. The what, why, who, when, where and how. Okay? So what is it we need to talk about? Well, even from listening to the presentations we've had so far today, I can sit there listening and think, right, what are the sexual health dimensions of all of this? So even whether it's taking physical exercise or the opposite, not taking physical exercise. Look at the ways in which people may be drinking too much alcohol. Look at the way that relationships may go up and down and sometimes end, okay? So there's so many issues that we can actually talk about. So the what is critically important here. What is it that you need to talk about? And even if you just did a big mind map exercise on exploring this word sex, whether it's sex, sexualities, well-being, what is it that you have to talk about? Now, when it comes to the why, I've all already given you some of the reasons for that, because lots of the issues can be preventable. You know, um, look how the uh, uh, um, Richard the first speaker this morning, how, how he mentioned the number of men that die with prostate cancer, huge number dying with prostate cancer, one of the biggest cancers in the UK, and especially a leading cancer in males. And yet, there are some ways that some men might be able to prevent this earlier. And certainly there's been lots of research on different ways of preventing it. Now, you may hear people talking about um, eating pomegranate or drinking pomegranate juice regularly. That may seem to help over the years. helped as best as possible earlier in life. So really important then to consider that's the reason why. Now, when it comes to who, and even when I mentioned masturbation, then some of you may think, oh, blimey, I could never talk like that. It's not going to be me. So whose job is it? Well, from the point of view of who, well, certainly I'd say every single health and social care professional should be able to talk about all of this. Okay, they really should be able to do it. So say, for example, if you've got somebody in the armed forces who's got diabetes and let's say a male, he's got diabetes and he goes to see maybe the diabetes nurse specialist. And that specialist may be fantastic at talking about blood tests, about insulin regime, about diet, about exercise. Fantastic. But if that healthcare professional doesn't say, look, out of every man with diabetes, one in two will end up with erectile dysfunction. How's your diabetes affecting you that way? If we're not addressing it, then we've wiped out 50% of men with diabetes in an important part of their lives that they may find it difficult to mention first. So it's got to come from somebody else. But it's not just down to the health and social care professionals. Um, look at the way in which health promotion 
So those of you working in health promotion departments, you get the messages out. How are you going to get them out and where are you going to get them out? And certainly the first speaker, Richard, again, he mentioned about the way in which younger people tend to use mobile apps. Look how the, how the way so many people are stuck to their phones. That's a new medium. To be able to, to communicate with people that way, even the way people use QR codes. It could be that someone hasn't got time to be, or maybe they don't want to be seen, reading a health promotion leaflet. But they could scan in the QR code quickly and look at it at their own leisure later. Okay, So it's looking at when to do this. Another, um, another activity that all men have to take part in is going for a wee. You're standing there at the urinals. There may be people standing either side of you. You may be chatting and talking to them. But look how that's a prime opportunity to get your message in front of them. Even if you're travelling down the motorway and you go into the toilets on the motorway services, there's always a message in front of you. Now, it may be trying to sell you life insurance, but it may also be talking about prostate cancer or erectile dysfunction. Men's issues right there where, they, where, where, where they're staring at them. So they're standing in the loo, there's a prime place to put the message. And especially if you're going to put a quick QR code in, they can scan that in and take the details away with them. And that's covering the, uh, where that should happen. And then how to do it. Now, hopefully, especially after a day like this, you'll all go away and think, well, how are we going to do it? Because obviously the way it's been done in the past hasn't always been the most efficient way. OK, so even when you look at the, the differences and the confusion in messages. I read an article now only over the weekend um, about British Army personnel out in Kenya on training events where they get a, a, a health briefing telling them that with all the commercial sex workers who, who are living nearby, um, they need to practice safer sex. So basically use condoms. But are they getting free access to condoms? Are people showing them how to use them in the first place? Are people telling them why it's so important and empowering them to use them? Because then a conflicting message is coming from the, the military police telling them that if they do have sex with commercial sex workers, technically they're breaking the law and they shouldn't be doing it. So the mixed messages confuse people. And especially when people then think, oh, well, damn it, you know, I'm, I'm into a risky lifestyle anyway. I might as well run the risk. OK, so the confusing messages tap into that how we've got to be clear with the messages. But again, starting with the intersectionality of individuals and seeing how they can take it on. It's no good telling a person, look, stop smoking. Just give it up. It's going to give you lung cancer. You'll get emphysema. It's going to be really awful for you. Give it up. That's giving the knowledge. And it's giving people the facts and figures. But I can remember a British TV advert in the 1990s about HIV. And right at the end of the advert, this man's voice just boomed out. He said, AIDS, you know the risks, the decision is yours. Now, that's really guilt tripping on people because they might think, oh, I took the risk. OK, I've got to pay the consequences for it. When, in fact, a genuine health promotion um, approach to this would be working with the individuals, seeing what motivates them and building on that motivational change for them. Because it's not just a case of talking about all of this, because we have to realise that for some people there are additional problems as well. And the word I'm using here is erotophobia, which literally just means fear of sex. Now, some people might be frightened of sex. Say, for example, people who have been sexually abused or raped may be frightened of sex. People who have been out in war-torn parts of the world who have seen such horrible things may be Put off from sex. But I'd say that the, the word erotophobia, the irrational fear of sex, it might also be an irrational fear of sex talk. It may be healthcare professionals, for example, who think, well, I was never trained to talk about that, so I can't do it. They're just frightened of mentioning it. And if you look at the research, especially around men's health, when men do go to health services, sometimes they have got private or you, you, um, sensitive things they want to talk about. Sometimes it's referred to as the door handle moment because they'll come in for whatever they've come in for, talk about all of that, and then just as they're going out, they say, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, 
and then they'll come out with it. So sometimes it's a fear of talking about it. And lots of research shows that sometimes patients think, well, I won't mention it until they mention it to me first. And the healthcare professionals are thinking, well, I'm too shy to mention it unless they bring it up in the first place. In the end, nobody talks about it. So there are lots of different issues here, and especially with some of the, some of the hatreds and discriminations going on. So sometimes pe people may find it um, really difficult because of prior experiences, especially if they have been discriminated against. And that's where this term toxic masculinity masculinities can come in as well and look at the way in which then that can be turned in on an individual if they're feeling bad about themselves maybe because they've been bullied over something in life they can turn it in on themselves <clears throat> from one point of view it may then lead to low self-esteem for others it may be internalized out of them they may think, right, well, if I just pretend I'm just like one of the lads and do what everybody else is doing, no one's going to suspect me. So the internalisation can be problematic for themselves and for others. But certainly from the point of view of low self-esteem, I'd say that some of the problems that can go on there, if you're working with someone that has got low self-esteem, on the one hand, they just won't, won't give a damn about themselves. So why should they change? Why should they protect themselves? Because they just feel so bad about themselves. That's where you need to start working. Okay? They feel bad about themselves. Another aspect is um, um, th th they just don't give a damn what, 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 uh, what's going to happen, but then they, they're craving love and attention. And then they might be frightened of being rejected. So those three things can form a whole toxic trio here in relation to low self-esteem. But on the other side of the screen here, which is talking about the taboo, silence, non-existence, look at the way in which so many of these words um, can be attached to being male or aspects of being male. And in that case, it's difficult to talk about them. Now, the word stigma just means a mark or a sign, but more often than not, it refers to something that's perceived as being negative. So if there's something negative that's perceived about a person, say, for example, um, look at the way sometimes people are being bullied. So what are they being bullied about? What's the mark or the sign or the label for that individual that others find that they're then attacking? So there's that, uh, um, the, the problem about stigma. If you've got more than one person sharing that same stigma, then obviously that's where stereotyping is coming in. Um, and then look at the way in which people can make prejudgments, prejudice about this. And if they act on the prejudice negatively, that's where they're leading to discrimination. Okay. Um, at the top of the screen, where it's saying taboo, silence and non-existence, it was a French philosopher, Michel Foucault, that came up with that term, just in a different order. But if there is something that's taboo, so say, for example, when I mentioned in Kenya then, the way in which uh, um, soldiers are being told about the commercial sex workers outside, if the, if the military police is saying to them, you mustn't have sex with those because you'll be breaking the law and you'll have to face up to it then it's a taboo issue. They can't talk about it. So they can't talk about, well, am I at risk? Should I be using condoms? What's the risk of HIV out here? What other sexual infections? If it's considered a taboo, then nobody's talking about it. And if they're not talking about it, it appears as if it's non-existence. So, so many of these issues um, actually need to come out, need to be spoken about far more often. OK, and I think with, um, oh yeah, for the next one then, looking at uh, this term, sexual orientation and gender identity, or sexual orientation and gender identity expression. Even when we use the word sexuality, which is thrown around so much these days, you know, so many people seem to be talking about sexuality, but it's important for us to remember that no matter what our orientation, we may not actually have the identity or the label that matches that. Now, especially within um, walks of life like the armed forces, look how maybe more in the past, look how many young armed forces personnel would be expected to get married nice and early. And they get married, maybe they have children because the family want them to have grandkids, all of that sort of stuff goes on. But where's that person's attractions? 
And what are they doing about those attractions? What behaviours are they doing? How many men in the armed forces have woken up in the morning, looked at the person next to them in bed, sorry mate, must have been the drink. So it's really important that we don't confuse sexuality with just a label that a person's happy enough to use about themselves. We need to explore as well their attractions and their behaviours because their behaviours may be putting them and others at risk because of the taboo of being able to talk about their orientation or their identity. Okay, and finally in this section then, and again, I'm not gonna go through all of these words just for you to take away with you, um, look at ways in which we do need to treat people um, with equity, respect and inclusion. And that can go right across sexual health and sexual well-being here. Um, let me just pick in on the bottom bit when he's talking about prevention, so early detection. So many of the conditions in life that men do suffer with, especially later on in life, can be prevented if there was early detection. Even testicular cancer, which affects younger males rather than older males, uh, and it can be a real fast grower. But if it's detected early, it can be treated so successfully. So the whole notion of prevention here is really, really important. And that means that health services, especially in the armed forces, need to take these gender messages and be able to work with them to be able to appreciate where men are at, and also to be able to talk to men about issues that are often considered, oh, that's what she's thinking of, the contraception side of it. So when you're talking about contraception, realising that condoms protect against sexual infections. It's no good a man just thinking, oh, I've got a girlfriend or a wife, she's using contraception, so I don't need to think about it. And then all of a sudden, maybe he's having uh, um, relationships with other people as well. So pushing the notion of condoms as a protection against sexual infections. And back as far as 1999, the World Health Organization suggested that every first access to sexual health services should have condoms freely available. So that was talking about sexual health clinics, but I'd say it would be much better if they were freely accessible in so many other places. Why do, they, why do they need to be hidden away in the toilet in a machine that you have to pay a few pounds for a couple of condoms? They can be made so easily available. And think of the cost that would then be saved from ongoing infections. So a small amount of money to get the condoms in the first place, uh, but certainly some great benefits of all of those. And in fact, the Terence Higgins Trust has said that the armed forces have got this great intention to do this. So please keep the armed forces um, on its toes there in being uh, um, strict to its commitments. And here's the final one, looking at improving men's health by collaborating one with each other. I'm really glad that Richie said right at the beginning of the day, take a message away from each person, because the message I always ask my students to consider is what difference can I make? If from today, from each of the presentations, you take one thing away and do one thing differently, then that's the difference that you can make. And where that difference is going to make a, uh, an impact is on the list here down the middle of the page. So generally, improving men's health and well-being valuing positive role models, acknowledging the contribution of men and boys, because sometimes men and boys might think, I haven't got much to contribute here. Or especially talking about sexual health, so many of them think, well, it's women that talk about contraception and it's gay males that talk about HIV. Now that's being so stereotypical and is not appreciating that wider sexual health is important for each and every one of us. And in that case, we'd be fostering, uh, fostering positive gender relations and making the world a better place. And the note I wish to end on here is that when you look at some of the statistics around sexual health or sexual ill health, look at the way in which it seems to pit males against females. I noticed it over the weekend as well. Um, the, 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 there was one tweet saying that now more females go to university than males. Or look how some of the newspapers every August time will say, oh, yet again, more girls have got A-levels than boys. 
Now, listen to the subliminal message in there. If they sort of say, oh, well, more girls are going to university or more girls are getting better A-levels, it's as if to say, well, that's not right. The boys should be doing it. But this isn't a battle of the sexes. What we ought to be looking at, rather than, than comparing male against female, in, the which, in which way so many stats do, then what we should be doing is looking, what can we prevent? rather than what's inevitable. So some things may be considered inevitable. So many of the issues we talk about, especially around gendered health, are preventable. But the only way we're going to present, uh, prevent them is by dealing with them much earlier. OK, I can't believe I've managed to stick to 39 minutes. Um, you, you'll get the Prezi, so you'll have all the references. And I've put a lot of video links and other things on here. So. Uh, Feel free to use them, and if you want any more, please just contact me and let me know. Okay, Richie, that's my 40 minutes up. David, that's absolutely amazing. Okay. And um, if any of the audience have any questions for David, uh, yeah. he'll be joining us uh, at 16.20 alongside uh, the two remaining uh, guest speakers. Um, so do have a think, dig deep, ask those questions that you may not uh, wish to ask any other time. Because uh, David is the font of all knowledge, <laughs> on these uh, very taboo subjects. So thank you very much.